and welcome to the 20th and final session in the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. Today's event caps off our year of informative and thought-provoking presentations and conversations on the full range of agricultural innovations. We began this program back in January with a panel devoted to thinking about farms and farmers of the future. We complete our long arc of investigation today with a return to thinking about the future of agriculture with a session entitled, Moving from Projects to System Change, Setting the Future Research Agenda. Today, our panelists will be continuing an important conversation on achieving impacts at scale. We started this conversation with the Scale Up Conference at Purdue in 2018 and have revisited the topic multiple times this year. As we have throughout the year, today we bring to the stage a set of global thought leaders and experienced practitioners to address our topic. I'm Gerald Shively, Associate Dean and Director of International Programs in the College of Agriculture at Purdue University, your host for the forum. On behalf of the organizing committee, our advisory group, and everyone contributing to this effort, I'd like to welcome you. I'd also like to thank USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service for sponsoring this year-long series of events. If you are joining us for the first time, please note that recordings of all 20 forum events covering six major themes, ranging from innovations in genetic improvements to innovations in post-harvest management, are available on the forum website. To lead today's discussion, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Dr. Simon Winter, Executive Director of the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. Dr. Winter brings to the virtual stage a wealth of experience from both the public and private sectors, and we are thrilled that he is here today to lead our discussion. I'll now hand it over to Simon to introduce our topic and our speakers. I hope you enjoy the program and please stay for the live question and answer session that will follow the presentations. Um, I'm uh, very excited to be moderating this discussion for a number of reasons. Um, one of which is we've been on this, uh, I would say, journey uh, towards clarifying what scaling means and how to bring it into action um, in developing country agriculture and food work uh, for several years. And Jerry, thanks to you for helping to host the uh, Scaling Up conference that happened now over three years ago at Purdue University. And, and Purdue has really been an outstanding supporter and anchor of this uh, initiative and, and um, related conversations and research and so on uh, ever since then. Um, we uh, also have many other organizations now that are working in this space um, and the scaling community of practice, uh, which is not just, of course, focused on food and agriculture and rural development, but much broader, uh, has been very active um, in this area and becoming increasingly uh, formalized now with a website and working papers and discussions and so on. And, and I imagine most of you on this call are aware of all of that. So let me say a little bit more about why this is important for me personally, and then we'll move to the first speaker. Um, two things. One, uh, I believe that if we are going to achieve success in overcoming the challenges that we face, which are growing, by the way, um, in um, smallholder agriculture, developing country agriculture, uh, we're only going to do it if we all work together to achieve transformational change at scale. Um, this can't happen if we just carry on doing all uh, just our own individual projects and then hoping for the best. Um, and so uh, we've embedded this now in our foundation's uh, strategy, which we launched a few months ago. Um, and scaling uh, is really at the heart of the work we do to try and uh, bridge the gap between uh, innovations and uh, use cases on the ground and, and adoption by smallholders and by businesses and governments working with smallholders. Um, and then more specifically to today's topic, um, what we've realized in this group of institutions that's working on this agenda 
over the last few uh, years is that we need to um, really bring um, uh, scaling not just on individual innovations, uh, but scaling on a system level. Uh, and so this link between scaling and system change has emerged. And uh, in particular, if we think about this as we focus at Syngenta Foundation on sm low income smallholders, there's almost this perverse effect that as you try and scale, you're going to inevitably get into more remote rural communities uh, where the infrastructure is weaker, the market systems and the presence of market players is more limited, um, and uh, the hazards often associated with things like uh, climate change and other risks uh, actually increase, um, water access, energy access, etc. All of that gets more complicated. So just as we're trying to scale, uh, the challenges get harder. Uh, and so we can't overcome those challenges without thinking about the broader systems at work uh, and really tackling then system change as well. And I encourage all of you who are interested in this topic to look at our strategy and please get in touch with us if you have feedback on it and if you're interested in working on these uh, issues uh, with us. So with those uh, few words, let me move now to um, today's topic and our first speaker. So we're, look, we're talking about, you know, really today, how do we move from the projects, the development projects in the most part, um, to uh, system change. Uh, and then looking at what should a future research agenda be for Jerry and his colleagues at Purdue and all of you who are interested in doing research uh, on this. Our first speaker is Brian Milder. Brian is a good friend of mine um, and the founder and CEO of Aceli Africa. And uh, he's going to talk about the challenges around access to finance for agri SMEs and how to think about that from a systems perspective. Brian, over to you. A few months ago, I sat with Robert Lukamai, a loan officer for SME Impact Fund, as he recounted a visit he recently made to a rice processing company in a remote part of Northwest Tanzania. The round trip drive usually takes a day and a half from Lukamai's office in Arusha. Not ideal but doable. This time, his car broke down on the bumpy roads, adding an extra day and a half. And by the time he got there, he said that his car looked like it had just finished a rally race. And here's the evidence. So three days of travel just to meet the business and decide whether to underwrite a $43,000 loan. And that's only the beginning. As another loan officer from a Kenya bank explained, for agricultural loans, there's a second set of questions on top of the normal business analysis where the risk team asks, what's going on with the global commodity prices? How is rainfall affecting production? And what about the locusts? No, seriously, Kenya recently had its worst locust outbreak in 70 years. Between the challenges of reaching remote borrowers and the additional due diligence required, lenders in East Africa estimate that it takes nearly twice as long to underwrite a loan in agriculture compared to other sectors. Serving new borrowers, or unfamiliar value chains adds even more cost. This is why most lenders are reluctant to finance agriculture. So maybe it shouldn't come as a surprise that even though two thirds of the population in East Africa depends on agriculture for their livelihood, only 5% of bank lending goes to the sector, just 5%. Small and medium enterprises or SMEs, such as agro dealers, farmer cooperatives, processing companies, have the potential to drive agricultural growth if they have access to reliable sources of financing. And this could be working capital or capital expenditure loans ranging from 25,000 to half a million dollars. With the right financing, the rice processor, rice processor that Robert Lukamai visited can buy crops from 150 smallholder farmers, employ 12 workers, and supply local communities with more affordable food than foreign imports. There's been a longstanding debate in agricultural finance about whether risk is real or perceived, but it's mostly been anecdotal since there's been very little data on the economics of agricultural lending. Aceli Africa wanted to get to the bottom of this. So in 2018, we and our partners set out to gather first of its kind data from 35 lenders on the economics of 13,000 loans totaling $4 billion. And we learned two important things. First, risk is real. 
risk lending to agricultural SMEs in East Africa is at least twice as high as lending in other sectors. And second, all the additional travel time and the due diligence costs add up, reducing returns so that they're four to 5% lower for agri-SME lending than in other sectors. So there's a substantial opportunity cost to agricultural lending, and lenders are making a rational decision to focus their human and financial resources in other sectors. Previous approaches to catalyze the ag finance market have focused on loan guarantees, which usually cover 50% of the loan. Data, Aselli's data suggests that these guarantees, which can be effective in the right circumstances, address only one quarter of the return gap in agricultural lending. In other words, traditional loan guarantees simply aren't enough to get the market moving for agri-SME lending. Aselli takes a different approach, and here's how it works. Based on our data findings, we design financial incentives to share in the risk and defray the operating costs of lending to agri-SMEs in remote areas. To be clear, Aselli does not make loans directly to SMEs or provide capital to lenders for them to make loans. Rather, we pay lenders about $1 of donor-funded subsidy for every $12 of their own capital that they lend. The funding comes from USAID Feed the Future, the IKEA Foundation, Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, and more recently from the Dutch and UK governments. Our aim is to spur increased lending by providing enough of a nudge to overcome the risk and opportunity cost barriers that I mentioned earlier. What's key is that increased lending to agri-SMEs is only a means to the end. Our ultimate goal is to improve livelihoods for smallholder farmers, create jobs for workers along agricultural value chains, and build a more inclusive and sustainable food system. To ensure that lending is going to enterprises that advance these objectives, we incorporate impact into our financial incentives for lenders. This means that we offer higher incentives to SMEs that did not previously have access to finance. And we also tier the incentives to reward loans that meet higher standards for gender inclusion, food security and nutrition, and climate and the environment. Thus far, 26 lenders in Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, and Tanzania are participating in Aseli's financial incentives program, including a mix of banks and uh, in international impact investors. And in our first year of operations, Aseli has supported lenders in making 254 loans, totaling $30 million. What's notable, especially in the context of COVID, where lenders are reluctant to take more risk, is that nearly half of the SMEs are accessing finance for the first time. These SMEs, in turn, are purchasing over $100 million of crops from about 250,000 smallholder farmers. By 2025, Aselli aims to mobilize 600 million in lending and improve livelihoods for over 1 million farmers and workers. And as the market becomes more competitive and efficient, we plan to lower the incentives for lenders while also building an evidence base that convinces policymakers in the four focus countries to replicate the model on an even larger scale. While we're still in the early stages of implementation, three key learnings have emerged. First, the private sector is participating and a growing number of lenders, including many of the leading banks in East Africa, are now approaching Aseli. Second, the initial results are promising in terms of steering private capital towards higher impact incentives. And these include first-time borrowers, women-led businesses, and businesses in remote areas like the ones that Robert Lukamai uh, was visiting. And at the same time, there are also practical limitation and limitations in terms of how much we can target incentives and how uh, to keep them simple enough for lenders uh, to be able to adopt them. Third, interventions on the capital supply side must be complemented by investment to build the addressable demand. Aseli is working with partners to offer technical assistance so that more SMEs are prepared to access and manage financing. Of course, the need for private investment, technical assistance, and value chain development far exceeds the capacity of Aseli and our partners. Substantial investments have been made over the years by African governments and donors in research, TA, and market development, but the results of those investments have been limited in the past by insufficient private capital. We now see an opportunity to take advantage of this new interest from private sector lenders and put these pieces together. 
And this brings us back to Robert Lukumai in Tanzania. So four weeks after he returned from his trip and washed his car, SME Impact Fund approved the $43,000 loan to the rice processor, thanks in part to $5,000 in incentives from Aseli. Now that SME Impact Fund has one client in the region, Lukumai is meeting other businesses in the same area and plans to develop a cluster of investments in the region. The idea is that these SMEs will grow, they'll purchase more from more farmers, they'll employ more workers, and they'll sell more food to Tanzanian consumers. And as these businesses grow, they'll also become profitable for SME Impact Fund to serve. So they'll no longer need incentives from Aseli. And by that time, the roads might be just a bit smoother for Robert Lukumai's commute. Brian, thank you so much. Um, a very compelling story of how you took uh, what was initially uh, very solid fact-based research, uh, looking at the systems of work around uh, SME agri uh, financing, and then really thinking about what were the true challenges um, to changing the system so that financing could flow more efficiently and more effectively where it's needed. And this really took, a, as I heard you, a behavioral perspective then on thinking about you know, what is the behaviors of the SMEs, what's the behaviors of the financiers uh, that are holding back for various reasons on lending or financing them in different ways. Um, and then what about the policy aspects? And then coming up with a way of tackling all of that um, in, a, in an incentive-driven way that responds to the behavioral nudges, and you use that word nudge, uh, in order to change the way that uh, finance can flow. Um, so a very, very interesting example and great to hear of the successes already being achieved by Aseli. Let's go to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Sise uh, Sinama Boltena. Uh, he's the Senior Program Manager for the Sequoia Declaration Federal Program Delivery Unit, uh, focusing on uh, intractable nutritional challenges in the Ministry of Health uh, in Ethiopia. Um, and Dr. Sise is going to talk to us about um, the Sakota Declaration and how they are, the government of Ethiopia and partners are uh, putting in place actions to end stunting uh, and talking about a phased approach uh, to going from uh, sort of pilot scale, let's say, towards uh, you know, full scale. Um, so uh, with all of that, very excited to have you with us. Dr. Sise, over to you. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak uh, in this uh, uh, meeting. The, um, I'll be speaking on the Sakota Declaration Expansion Phase, uh, an innovation of the government of Ethiopia to ending stunting. So to give you a little bit of background on the Sakota Declaration, Sakota Declaration is the government of Ethiopia commitment to end stunting among children under two years by 2030. This declaration builds on and accelerates the implementation of the country's food and nutrition strategy. And when it was originally declared in 2015, it aims to save a total of over 7.8 million children by the year uh, 2030, which is in 15 years period of time. The Sakota Declaration Implementation Strategy coordinates 10 sector ministries, namely health, agriculture, water and energy, education, women and social affairs, transport and logistics, irrigation, uh, lowland area development, planning and development, innovation and technology and finance, based on the current government structure. And in the past years, we have tested six innovations that are uh, relevant for improving the challenges of multisectoral coordination. These are the federal and regional program delivery units, the community lab, the first 1,000 days plus public movement, the Agriculture Innovation Technology Center, the Costed Wereda based multisectoral nutrition investment plan in the data revolution. I'll be talking on them later on in terms of how they contributed for the innovation phase. The Sakota Declaration has a 15 years roadmap, which is divided into three phases. The first phase, which we call is the innovation phase, we just concluded. We did that by learning by doing approach in 40 waradas. Waradas refers to districts. And based on that learning, we are now expanding into additional 240 high-standing prevalent burden waradas across the country. 
The last phase, which is from 2026 to 2030, is a national scale up, which will build on the learning of the expansion phase. So the Sakota Declaration has a very high level uh, Ethiopian government leadership and commitment where at federal level, the Sakota Declaration is led by His Excellency Yato de Meko Makonen. Uh, His Excellency is the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs who also chairs the Interministerial Steering Committee that coordinates the declaration at federal level. In that regional level, Excellency is the regional president led the multi-sectoral uh, platform where a number of sectors work together. The government as a priority uh, also shared the Sakota Declaration in various platforms. To mention some of them, the United Nations General Assembly, which was held in New York in 2019, the Global Food System Summit, the African Leaders for Nutrition High Level Forum, as well as also the current uh, this uh, week's summit, which is the Nutrition for Growth Summit. And also Sakota Declaration was also identified as one of the game-changing solutions in Ethiopian food system transformation roadmap. So this all shows that the Kota Declaration is the highest priority for the government of Ethiopia. So based on the implementation in the past four years, we did an impact study jointly with John Hopkins University. And by the year 2021, the innovation phase has resulted in a 7.6 absolute reduction of the stunting in Amhara region and also a 6.7% uh, stunting reduction in Waradas where we implemented the innovation phase in Tigray region. And through the various interventions, over 1,000 children days has been prevented, and over 109,000 stunted cases has been prevented during the innovation phase. Increased complementary feeding, which was the primary driver for the stunting reduction, where it accounts to over 90% of stunted cases averted, where agricultural interventions has contributed the major impact. So what are the success factors for the Sakota Declaration Innovation Phase? Before we scale up, we also identified the success factors that contributed for the scale up. The first is the federal and regional government commitment and ownership, where there was a huge and also rigorous planning approval leadership as well as also an annual financial allocation uh, from federal government, as well as also regional government, in total between 10 to 15 million USD per year, as well as also deployment of staff at federal, regional, and Warada levels. The second one is utilization of the performance measurement and accountability tools with a scorecard, which was reviewed and endorsed through six monthly review high-level meetings at federal and regional level, as well as also more frequent meetings at regional and also uh, Warada level. The third success factor is a gender responsive programming, especially women and also pregnant lactating mothers have benefited from various Sakuta declaration interventions to mention them through the nutrient dense crops, vegetable and fruit, a milk for uh, goats for milk program, where we have been able to reach nearly 100,000 pregnant and lactating women and over 1 million uh, chickens has been distributed to nearly over 204,000 pregnant and lactating women. And also through water, social protection, as well as also women and children, and also health sector interventions, women and children has been the priority uh, participants of the program. The third success factor is a collaboration and effective networking with development partners. This is specifically through joint financing for innovations and implementing new innovations, deployment of technical partners and assistance to support the innovation. So in this regard, we really would like to thank the various development partners that have contributed for the innovation phase. The last success factor is the introduction of innovations to solve the challenges of multisectoral coordination. The program delivery unit has been critical to improve coordination as well as also accountability the community lab approach has been uh, has been uh, really instrumental to mobilize the various stakeholders in terms of uh, uh, availing local remedial actions that has been widely implemented. The first 1,000 days public movement has been effective in terms of uh, providing various advocacy activities 
social mobilization and also behavioral change activities. And also this has been mainstreamed into the sectoral plans. The data revolution has been also uh, been utilized as I have shown you earlier for performance measurement, as well as also we have developed also what we call it a tool called UNIF, Unified Nutrition Information System for Ethiopia. That has been now being scaled up in, in a number of waradas. We have now the training manuals and also a user guide. And also the costed warada based planning has been instrumental for government as well as also partners to begin allocating budget for priority activities as well as also partners to support the implementation of the Sakota Declaration Innovation financially and technically. So these five innovations have been tested and they're successful. Now they are also ready for a scale up. Of course, some of them like the program delivery unit, it has already been uh, scaled up. So these are the success factors. So based on the impact as well as also the success factors, we have been able to do uh, an evidence synthesis to, to document the various experiences from the 40 waradas, national experiences and also global experiences to do the scale up plan. And from the 40 waradas, now the government has approved to scale up uh, based on the learning to 240 waradas, which we have started the implementation as of July uh, 2021. And these waradas are located across the countries in 10 regions and two city administrations. We are also expanding the promising practices that are the innovations that were identified in the innovation phase. During the expansion phase, we are also expecting the regional government and also city administrations to contribute financially for the implementation of the expansion phase that will extend from 2021 to 2025. As I said earlier, the scale-up phase will be also built up based on the learning of the innovation phase. In terms of reach and also investment needs, the scale-up phase is going to uh, cover over 27 million people and also nearly 1 million pregnant lactating women and over 2 million children under two years. We also did the investment case and also the expansion in the scale-up phase roadmap where over 85 billion bur, nearly 2 billion USD is needed for the coming five years. For the first year, which we started in July 2021, the government has already allocated a startup uh, fund, which is nearly 10.5 million USD. And now we are working with the respective waradas to develop their costed warada based plan. And also we are now expecting the regions also to contribute an equivalent amount. So in this regard, uh, to facilitate and also effectively implement the expansion phase, we also call upon all our stakeholders to contribute for the successful implementation of the expansion phase and also scaling up of the tested innovations. Let's invest on nutrition uh, and also let's work together for successful scale up of the Sakota Declaration expansion phase. I thank you. Dr. Sise, thank you so much. It was a really fascinating story. Um, you know, taking a really long-term perspective on how to uh, very systematically go about a process that could end up with adoption at a uh, national scale. Um, and I think particularly relevant to today's uh, topic is the role that research um, and learning plays in that journey. Um, you mentioned at the beginning you're taking a learning by doing approach, starting in a limited number of waredas, and then uh, really backing that up with a whole of government uh, engagement, you know, with top down senior ministerial leadership, very committed to the program. I think these are really standout features. And then the role of the impact study and the digital and data analytics process to measure progress, generate insights, generate evidence, uh, that enables that learning by doing to, to happen in practice and also to then justify investments uh, to, into the next uh, phases towards the, the scale up. So really, really interesting case study and we wish you great success in the future uh, with the initiative. Uh, now it's my pleasure to uh, turn to uh, Dr. Peter Hurst. Uh, Dr. Hurst is a professor of horticulture and the assistant director of the international programs in agriculture at Purdue University. 
Peter has been uh, a constant witness and uh, participant and audience in the entire series of the Global Agricultural Innovation Forum sessions that have happened across the course of this year. And today, of course, we're at the end of that. This is the last one of um, the series for, for this year, at least. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we look forward to hearing from Peter on his, some of his reflections. Just before that, I just want to make a reminder uh, to all of our participants today to please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, Peter is the last of our speakers, then we'll go to a panel discussion. I'll pose a few questions to each of the speakers to get us kicked off, uh, and then we'll bring in your questions and um, uh, look forward to a, a rich discussion in the, in the second part of the, uh, the session today. Um, so with that, uh, Peter, over to you. What are your reflections on the journey this year? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Winter. Today, I'd like to speak with you a little bit about the process of innovation to scaling to change. Over the last year, we've been conducting the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum, a series of forums that have engaged over 100 global thought leaders in the area of innovations in agriculture. So why are innovations in agriculture important? Well, they're important because they directly impact many of the sustainable development goals. So issues such as no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, gender equality, decent work and economic growth, climate action, and the list, the list goes on. And so, so these are really important innovations because of the potential impact. So we started out our forums talking about what farms and farmers of the future would look like. We talked about how they'd be productive and efficient in using resources. We talked about how they'd be sustainable and resilient, um, especially to climate change. We also talked how they would include enabling technologies and how they would be connected to markets. Uh, you know, the old, the old story about you don't make any money from producing an agricultural product, you only make money when you sell it. That, that really highlights the importance of the whole value chain from farm to consumer. And so throughout the series, we've talked about innovations in genetics. And of course, uh, many of these are, are obvious and well-known, but there's also a number of innovations in the areas of post-harvest management, loss mitigation, food safety, adding value through processing, and also incorporating of, of technologies uh, such as ICT, information and communication technologies, that can be applied throughout the value chain. Of course, entrepreneurship is, is also very important and we were very pleased to uh, conduct a pitch uh, contest uh, to highlight some, some outstanding African entrepreneurs. You know, in Africa, 60% of the population is 25 years old or younger. So it's a very high youth population, which also tends to have high unemployment rates. And we often talk in terms of the youth dividend but dividends only pay if you make the right investments. And so too often, the focus is on technical training and vocational training, but now we realize that these are really only effective if they're combined with training in non-cognitive skills, the soft skills, if you like. And so all these innovations apply beyond just agricultural production. And so we need to take more of a complete food systems approach and not just a production approach. And for true impact, we obviously need to talk about scaling. And so we're really pleased to present this series of, of, of seminars on scaling uh, in partnership with the Scaling Community of Practice. And I'd like to thank Julie Howard for her leadership in, um, in fostering this partnership uh, between the Scaling Community and, and Purdue University. So innovations without scaling are really just a series of pilot projects. And at best, perhaps they have local or regional impact. In one of our previous sessions, Larry Cooley stated, and I really like this, that projects are not our friend. And I like that because it's a really a good way of thinking about this. And so often we start with the innovation. We've got an innovation, now we're gonna scale it and we're gonna solve some problem. But this is kind of like having a solution in search of a problem. And we need to change our focus from projects to overall system change. And so starting with the end result in mind. 
So in scaling, we often talk about intermediation. Intermediation links innovation with delivery at scale. So it includes things like capital and partnerships along the, the value chain. And often this is the piece of the cycle that's broken. So we need to focus on this intermediation, linking these two together. We also need to keep in mind that the pathway to scale is not purely economic. Often we think just in terms of economic terms, but there's really an important role for subsidies, for government, and for regulatory components. And we need to apply these thematic solutions that we've talked about throughout the Global Agricultural Innovation Forum, genetic, post-harvest, et cetera. We need to apply these solutions with local partnerships, local implementation, using local knowledge. And so, and this needs to involve actors throughout the value chain. It needs to involve central and local governments. It needs to involve the private sector. It needs to involve multilateral organizations. And so we need to have these system-wide partnerships. We also need to keep in mind that scaling is not linear and that shocks often occur. And so we shouldn't expect it just to go smooth in a linear fashion because that's often not how it happens. In one of our previous sessions, Richard Cole did a really nice job in documenting some of the clear, some of the aspects of scaling uh, that are essential to be, to be effective. He talked about having a clear vision and taking into account not only economic components, but some of the political and ethical and social considerations. He talked about, um, about what is the desired impact and scale and what are, what's the innovation or the intervention that we're trying to scale and who are our partners in this and, and which of those partners are going to play uh, key roles. And so all these factors need to be not only coherent, but all aligned and fit together for it to be effective. We also need to keep in mind that change takes time. And so we need to be perseverant and have patience for this change to occur. And so I'd like to conclude this morning by just saying that we need to optimize all these factors, uh, especially this intermediation linking innovation with system change. Um, and by doing that, Hopefully we can move from projects to system change. Let me finish this morning by thanking a few people. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the USDA, the Foreign Agricultural Service for sponsoring uh, the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. I'd like to thank all our speakers and moderators and partners, over a hundred global leaders um, have participated throughout this forum. And all of these are available on our website. And so if you Google Global, Global Agriculture Innovation Forum, you'll find all of those. So if you missed some of the previous sessions, you can go back and view them. I'd like to thank you, our participants. We've had over 2,500 people register from more than 120 countries. And our sessions have had over 10,000 views so far. So obviously this is a subject that resonates. And lastly, but, but certainly not least, let me thank our team here at Purdue University. Um, our production team, all our folks that have put this together and support from our administration, uh, which is essential. So with that, let me uh, conclude and hand back to Dr. Winter and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Great, thanks so much, Peter, for those uh, very interesting uh, reflections. Um, uh, two points that I took away from what you were talking about. One is the, the breadth of innovations that are needed for agricultural and food system transformation. Uh, and how they need to not be just thought of as individual innovations to be scaled and adopted, but uh, really uh, the linkages between them and the interlinkages. Um, and then secondly, this point about partnerships and the roles of different organizations, particularly intermediary organizations. I want to pick that up in the discussion uh, shortly. I, I think you mentioned you know, very eloquently the diverse roles between uh, supporters and funders, governments, private sector uh, implementers, et cetera. Uh, I think a point I would add is also as we go through the process of going from innovation to scaling and system change, those roles probably need to evolve. Um, and it would be interesting perhaps to touch in on that as well. Um, I see Brian and Peter have their cameras on. Um, I don't see uh, Cisse um, yet. Can we, um, Cisse, are you able to put your camera on or are you going to stay off camera because of bandwidth issues? Yeah, I think I will stay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. So we'll, we'll do our best here. Um, 
Okay, uh, well, thank you uh, very much. We're going to move now into some questions. Uh, I pre-baked some questions, so I'm going to start with my own questions to the panelists, give you in the audience a little bit longer. We do have a few questions already in, um, but I welcome uh, more. So please uh, contribute your questions to the, uh, the Q&A, and we'll do our best um, in the next uh, little while to, uh, to work our way through all of them. Um, Okay, uh, very good. So, uh, Brian, I'm gonna come back to you uh, to kick us off. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that was so impressive in, in terms of the thinking behind Aselli is really this thought about the gap between the risks and returns um, for the lenders and, and how to bridge that um, uh, so that they can um, you know, address that hesitation that they, they have in, in taking the necessary risks to lean into agri-SME lending uh, and financing. Uh, my question is, what is the evidence that you used? I mean, again, coming back to the theme of today, this is about research as well. You know, what, was the, what was the evidence that you gathered? How did you gather that evidence um, to address that? Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, I think in the ideal scenario, there would be perfect evidence, right? We would know the lending economics, we would know the impact of every single loan, and we could put together a very precise tool that responds to the gap on any given loan in any sub-geography, and then tier it, um, calibrate it to the impact exactly. And of course, that wasn't possible and, and probably will never be possible. Um, and particularly when it comes to agri-SME uh, lending, there's just been a dearth of evidence historically. So we spent two years, number one. Uh, we spoke to 35 lenders and we had to chase them down. Um, we had to sign NDAs with them and extract their data. And then when we got it, it wasn't totally comparable between them. So we had to round a lot. We had to, it was as much art as science piecing it together. Just understanding the inc inc economics of the lending let alone then thinking about impact. And so we, we ended up tiering our incentives. Uh, we ended up using these two different approaches, one more on the risk side, one more on the return side. Um, we had certain projections, some of which have been more or less on track. Others have been pretty significantly off. We actually expected the average loan size to be at about 250,000. And thus far it's around 125,000 um, and on the other hand, the impact profile of the businesses that are being supported is quite similar to, to what we had um, been aiming for. So, um, yeah, I think this whole sector needs a lot more data. Uh, and by the sector, I'm talking about agricultural finance, whether it's at the level of SMEs or farmers. And um, technology is starting to disrupt and particularly at the level of individual farmers and customers, there are millions of them, and um, getting to big data and being able to use it well isn't easy, but it's a little more feasible than at the level of small and medium enterprises where there are thousands of them and uh, they're quite heterogeneous. Um, their financial records are not necessarily reliable. Um, being in a different value chain or different place in the value chain affects a lot the risk of lending to them. So um, the data that we've gathered is a step towards where uh, a market really needs to be, but there needs to be a lot more happening to, to build it up. Great, thanks, Ryan. Um, very insightful and, and, and inspirational, actually, uh, to the sort of extent and depth of research to really try and understand the problem and, and, and address the you know possible solutions, and then learn by doing again as you uh, evolve the, the way of testing that. One thing I, I didn't get in your presentation uh, was the you know again bringing back the other part of the theme, <laughs> system change. What is the pathway to system change? And, and do you already have any evidence or any basis for expecting that the, the local governments will learn from your way of doing the calculations? Uh, because, you know, you, you, you're set up as to be a kind of catalyst to change the system. Uh, so at some point you have to hand over to the system partners and that's going to be some combination of the private sector and the public sector. So do you have any basis yet for assuming that governments will uh, be able to take over the process you're pursuing and take on this de-risking role? And then similarly, do you have any basis for assuming the banks and private lenders will adjust the way that they calculate risks 
so that they can be more aggressive in their SME lending, perhaps with lower levels of support in the future? Yeah, I mean, both great questions. So um, the role of government in agriculture, I think, is, is well established. And any um, industrialized country globally has gone through agricultural development and government has been critical in that process. And usually there's also government involvement in the finance sector. Uh, uh, last year, uh, maybe it was 2019, we collaborated with um, ISF advisors on a piece looking at the role of government in Mexico, Turkey, and Uganda. And in, in Mexico and Turkey, um, more middle-income countries a little farther along in their development, uh, government has played a very active role um, around capital provision and de-risking in the ag sector. And we're starting to see that in Uganda as well. Uh, the agricultural credit facility that the government of Uganda set up about five years ago has had a significant effect in the country. Um, in October, Rwanda announced that it wants to double its agricultural lending by 2024. So, you know, what we're doing, of course, doesn't exist in a vacuum. And one of the encouraging signs for us is that the enabling environment in the region we're working in East Africa has been shifting. Um, each of the four countries has made announcements or started to, to move uh, from the public side in uh, recent months and years, and the private sector as well. There's a lot more interest in agricultural lending from banks. Um, we're getting approached by a lot of banks. And so it, it's definitely gonna be a process. It's also gonna look different in each country. In Kenya, there's been a decentralization um, over the last few years. The county um, governments are quite powerful um, and it, it policy might look different in, say, Kenya than, than Rwanda or Uganda, Tanzania. Um, so, yeah, we do expect that the data also will be a very important part of the, um, uh, trying to engage and, and influence policymakers. And we want it to be a dialogue. We don't think that we're going to build the solution that no one has ever thought of. And it's more about contributing into um, a process of building markets and um, and having our learning feed into that that broader discourse and um, and then again I think the the timing now relative to five years ago in East Africa um, is much more promising. Had to be a moment where I forgot to unmute. Um, thanks, Brian. No, well, good luck with that. I, I think it's. Um, I think it's exciting. I mean, I've been involved in this space for long enough to know that that last bit of the kind of migration or graduation into the local institutions is often the hardest part. So we'll keep our, our eyes on you and uh, try to support you in that process. Um, so I'm going to move over to Cisse at this point, um, and I have a couple of questions for you, Cisse. Uh, the first one is, um, uh, you mentioned this impact evaluation um, that was done in the innovation phase. Um, what role is that playing in convincing the organizations involved uh, with your initiative to support both the expansion phase and, and hopefully then the, the scale-up phase? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Simon. Uh, as uh, I have presented earlier, uh, in the past uh, years, uh, we have implemented the Sakota Declaration Innovation Phase uh, through participation of a wide uh, range of stakeholders, including government, non-government organizations, UN agencies, private sectors, as well as also mobilizing the, the, the community. So it ranges from federal level, which is the national level, to the Warada level, which is uh, the district level. Uh, so when we start the, the implementation, we did uh, a baseline uh, study to set the benchmark uh, for the uh, innovation phase. And then we started the implementation and finally uh, we did uh, the uh, impact study to see how the innovation phase uh, is progressing and also generate uh, the learning uh, as part of the uh, preparation for the expansion phase. So the phase one uh, impact evaluation has uh, showed uh, an evidence base on the successful implementation of the multi-sectoral interventions 
uh, and also has demonstrated uh, its impact uh, in terms of uh, reducing uh, stunting prevalence, uh, as well as also preventing a large number of uh, children uh, from stunting, and also uh, preventing uh, a number of children from uh, days uh, later to uh, undernutrition. So, uh, in terms of uh, you know convincing the organization to support the uh, expansion and uh, scale up phases, uh, the phase one uh, impact evaluation has uh, uh, proven the theory of change, where the quota declaration has uh, put at the beginning of the program, where multi-sectoral interventions with convincing uh, conducive environments, that is the government commitment, partner commitment, uh, and also learning by doing approach, uh, as well as also the performance management uh, and also uh, rigorous uh, monitoring and also public movement has an impact on stunting reduction. So the first thing that really uh, convinced the organization is, you know, uh, the theory of change that has built up has really uh, achieved the, the desired outcome. The second thing is, uh, you know, many organizations uh, would like to see an impact uh, to look for uh, additional uh, investment because in the expansion and also a scale of phases, uh, we are looking for uh, nearly 2 billion USD, uh, over 2 billion USD uh, for the uh, uh, expansion and uh, scale of phases. So in this regard, the evidence generated from the innovation phase the impact evaluation uh, will serve as uh, a significant evidence phase, uh, evidence base for organizations to understand uh, the value for money, as well as also the benefit of uh, multisectoral programming uh, in terms of uh, reducing uh, stunting uh, and also improving uh, the lives of children, communities, uh, the, when it is well uh, planned and uh, implemented. Uh, and uh, also, you know, uh, in many cases, uh, multi-sectoral, uh, multi-level, multi-stakeholder implementation is uh, usually considered very complex and is also very difficult to manage and also uh, understand the performance and the impact. Uh, I think the Sakota Declaration, which is being uh, a multi-stakeholder, multi-level, multi-sectoral, uh, a lot of uh, partners engaged. Uh, irrespective of the complexity, it has been uh, well managed to generate the, the impact uh, as uh, it was uh, presented in the study. So uh, this is now a proof of concept uh, for us uh, to consider uh, as part of the expansion base. So I think uh, the organizations that will be joining us will, will really be convinced on that. So uh, many organizations, we have been working together, uh, but we also look for our uh, new organizations uh, uh, you know, to join us uh, based on the proof of concept that was generated uh, during the learning by doing phase of the Sakota Declaration Innovation Phase. Thank you. Over to Simon. Thank you, Cisse. Um, I have a quick follow-up question. Um, listening to you, I, I'm reminded, and this is not. This is going to sound a little critical. It's not meant to be a critical. It, it's it's meant to be just a, a a point of questioning. I'm reminded of the Millennium Villages, you know, which were a very interesting experiment where you had a lot of really smart people working in a very concentrated way uh, to prove a concept could work at a relatively small scale. Um, and yet we know now with the sort of, you know, 2020 uh, hindsight benefits that, you know, that, that wasn't a scalable model and it in fact, you know, hasn't scaled. Um, one of the reasons I think is the financing um, that convincing larger and larger amounts of funders to, to crowd in around such uh, innovations is challenging. You've just said, you, you know, how you're planning to go about that. The other piece is the skills uh, and, and the resources that are needed, you know, to really replicate uh, a very good experiment at that sort of scale uh, on the skill side. Are you seeing any system changes being needed to ensure that in Ethiopia, the right skills are going to be available to support the growth phase uh, the, and the, uh, the expansion phase, sorry, and the scale up phase? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Simon. I think in terms of the uh, the system changes that uh, will be uh, deployed, is the first thing is 
the the government has uh, endorsed the uh, expansion in the scale of phases. Uh, we have de we did the evidence synthesis uh, to uh, both from innovation phase as well as nationally and globally to inform the expansion in the the scale of phases. So based on that, uh, now a ten years uh, roadmap and uh, investment case has been developed. I think that is also one of the big. Uh, decision from uh, you know the government to have that roadmap and investment case in place to guide uh, the coming uh, five years. So uh, this is a political as well as for, uh, and also financial commitment uh, uh, from the government side to you know to support the expansion and also the the, the scalar phases. Uh, the second part of it is the, uh, the the investment that the government has made in the innovation phase has been sustained also as part of the uh, the expansion and also the the, the scale up phase now to reach the 240 waradas the government has already approved and also made it as part of its investment plan uh, for the, this year for instance uh, as i mentioned earlier during the presentation uh, nearly uh, the 10.5 million usd has been allocated for this year uh, budget so this is now becoming part of the government system in terms of allocating uh, resources uh, to, uh, to, to contribute uh, for the expansion and scale of phases. So I think this will be now a catalytic also for other development partners to contribute their part uh, during uh, the, the expansion phase. Uh, of course, uh, in terms of uh, systematically uh, inclusion of the uh, uh, stunting as a priority government uh, uh, investment focus. The government has also included uh, reducing the stunting uh, among children under five to 13 percent as part of the 10 years uh, development plan, uh, which which just started in July uh, 2021. Uh, uh, that is a 10 years uh, investment plan, and also making zero stunting as part of the the plan. So I think. You know, putting it as part of the government development plan will also f uh, support uh, the, the the investment uh, in the in the coming years. Uh, of course, we have also looked at some good examples from our also development partners to support the uh, expansion and also scale up phases. Uh, specifically, uh, just to mention few examples like the partnership we had. Uh, our government had with the uh, African Development Bank uh, has resulted uh, to get uh, financing of what we call it a multi-sectoral approach for stunting reduction project, uh, which just started, uh, worth of uh, around 48 million USD. Uh, we also had uh, a, you know, a new project with our partner, uh, that is Max Foundation, which has uh, around 14.4 million euro. Uh, currently, we are also working with the World Bank uh, to support 30 Waradas on implementing stunting reduction project uh, as part of the human capital project uh, that is also uh, coming uh, in the coming uh, maybe new uh, uh, physically onwards. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we are also working with other partners, uh, current partners also supporting existing partners uh, during the, the expansion phase. Uh, we had also a very successful side event on December 3 uh, uh, as part of the Nutrition for Growth Summit. And uh, we really uh, you know, uh, got a lot of partners being committed to support uh, the expansion phase uh, uh, from the partner side. But the government Excellent. also has demonstrated practical commitment to support that. So I think these are uh, some of you know the the the, the you know the, the the reasons that you know our development partners need to be part of with us during the expansion phase. I look forward to sustain the existing partnership, and also look forward new partners to join us uh, in the expansion phase. Thank you. Over to you, Simon. Great. Thanks, Susan. And great to hear about your recent event on third of December. And uh, 
I think that reminds us that actually these big UN type events actually can play a role in mobilizing the support that's needed uh, for scaling uh, to happen. So uh, that's that's very exciting uh, for you and, and, and for all of your uh, program participants and beneficiaries. I'm going to turn over to Peter now. Um, Peter, you've been listening to this conversation as you've listened to others across the year. What do you think have been, um, you know, going back to this point that this process needs uh, intermediaries, it needs, uh, you know, uh, agency of some kind uh, to move intentionally from innovation to scale. What have been some of the memorable examples for you of effective intermediation? And in particular, I'm curious about, have any of those examples emerged from the system itself, rather than, for example, from outside agencies like, uh, you know, funders or development partners? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Simon. You, you know, we've had many examples throughout the uh, throughout the forum on on innovations that have been successful in making it to scale and have made made a real difference. A couple that, that, that spring to mind. Um, you know, back uh, earlier in the year when we were talking about genetic uh, innovations, both to crops, to livestock, to poultry, to fisheries. Um, obviously, there's there's huge advances being made in, in genetic improvements. And one, and, and as part of that, we, we had a whole session on, on looking at how we can improve um, access to some of these improved genetics. And, um, and in that, uh, one of our speakers, uh, Chike Imba from FAO, he talked about, about seed systems and how, uh, and he reminded us that, uh, that we can't have good crops without good seeds. And so looking at improved seeds, but how do we how do we actually put those seeds in the hands of farmers that can use them? And unless we can do that, this becomes a, a research project. It doesn't it has very little impact. And so he talked about a project called Seeds for Development. And I think this was in Central America where they were looking at beans, improved genetics of bean seeds and developed um, uh, seed companies. To, to improve the production of these seeds and distribute them. And of course, there's a lot of pieces of that puzzle that go along with that. We need to have certified seed that people have confidence in and see value in to actually uh, to, to adopt this technology. And, and so that would be one that would spring to mind that, that looked like it had, had great application. Another one that, uh, that was mentioned is the PIX project. This is the Purdue Improved Crop Storage. These are uh, hermetic um, storage bags for grain um, that basically seal the grain and reduce damage to that uh, to the grain from um, from pest uh, damage, and so it means that farmers can store the product for much longer and improves their marketing opportunities and their price for the product, and so uh, and these have been tremendously successful, and so we heard about we heard from some of their partners in that project. Um, Gates Foundation and others that uh, that talked about about what it took for those bags to become successful, and yeah, we can have a have a research project that shows yeah these bags um, you know reduce pest um, damage to a very low level. Okay, that's fine on a research basis, but how do we convince people of that? And we heard about training projects. We talked about um, about adoption of of the technology. And we also heard about branding um, and that along the way, as these uh, bags became successful, there are a number of imitators on the scene and some of them worked well and some of them didn't work well. And so about, um, about people's uh, perception or the perception of users and having confidence in the product to adopt the product. And so there are many pieces in the middle there. And so, um, and so I, th I think uh, they, they trained 7 million farmers and there were 30 million bags, tremendously successful, but a lot of pieces in the middle there. And so I would say those, those are two projects that, that come to mind that really exemplify uh, the role of, uh, of intermediation of making the link between the innovation and the application at scale. Okay, unmuted, um, back in action. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, no, very interesting. And and it's, uh, I mean, the PIX uh, story was one that was highlighted back in 2018 at the, the first conference. And 
it's been great to see that journey continuing uh, since then. Um, so coming to the one of the topics of today being the future research agenda, and, and there's a question actually that's just come in from Gary Boniski as well um, about, you know, the forum potentially continuing next year. So uh, I'm going to combine his question with my own question, which is, um, you know, if, if you think about the insights from this year and then you think about the agenda for next year, you know, how are you going to identify, you know, topics, further topics of broad interest? And in particular, you know, which research questions are emerging as, um, you know, ones that you think are needed to be addressed in order to move this, keep the knowledge frontier, let's say, in, you know, scaling and system change moving forward? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question, and uh, and thanks for that question also, Gary. Um, you, you know, I, I think in terms of research, there's no shortage of research questions and research projects. You know, in the research community, we're we're good at projects. We know how to do projects, right? We have a project. We get a very discreet team of people with expertise in that area, and we address that project. And as the project goes on. We learn more and more about the specifics of, of that of that issue. And you know, that's the way that research works, and we know how to do that. But that has in some ways is is separated from um, from adoption at scale. And so um, you know, Larry and others uh, during our forum have pointed out that uh, that you know projects um, is, is a very the project mentality is a very different mentality to a mentality of thinking about how do we achieve adoption at scale? And, and that missing piece, that, that intermediation um, is really important here. And that's an area that many of us in the research community are less comfortable with. We know how to do projects. If we're a geneticist, we know about genetics. We, we work with other geneticists. We can work on that and we're very comfortable there. We know how to do that. But when we talk about intermediation, suddenly we have to talk in areas that, or, or with folks way outside our area that we know less about. We need to talk about uh, to people like Brian who know about financing. We need to talk about, to talk to people who know about branding and, um, and about many of these other, about training, I mean, many other issues. And so our teams get to be very broad in terms of expertise and we get outside our, our comfort zone in our area of expertise. And I think that's really what's needed um, to drive the process forward. And so then it becomes more about application of technology and not development of technology. And then it becomes not a research project, but a development or an application project. And so the missing link between those two, I think really is the secret source that we need to focus on. And uh, and that's it sounds very simple, but, but it's, it's challenging. Um, but but that but if we're really going to achieve um, change at scale, that's where we need to focus our, our activities, I think. I, th I think that's a super, super interesting point, Peter. Um, I mean, I and maybe this is a challenge for Purdue and it, it might be great. Good to hear from you or even Jerry. I don't know if Jerry wants to you know join the panel before we close. Um, because, you know, universities are often very siloed in the way that their research is conducted. And yet what you're actually saying is you kind of need the research side to mirror the action side. So if we're talking about multi-stakeholders and CISA was very eloquent about the complexity that it's taking to address the stunting challenges in Ethiopia and how corralling so many different types of stakeholders together is, is, is absolutely critical. Brian talked about this, you know, the need to work right across from the SMEs to the farmers, to the governments, to the, you know, the, the big banks and so on. Um, and um, it, we kind of need the researchers to also come together with, with, you know, this sort of interdisciplinary research programs to mirror that complexity and really understand the complexity on the research side. So let's, let's park that for a minute because I want to go to the audience questions, um, but let's maybe come back to that in some closing remarks as you, particularly from your side, Peter, you think about that as the, you know, a, a future agenda for Purdue. Um, so the first question that came in from the audience was from Dr. Goyle, uh, who uh, was an eloquent speaker in last week's session. Um, and uh, he is asking, and I guess Brian and Peter, this is more for you perhaps than for Cisse, um, 
our research is too focused on, and again, I guess it picks up on the point we're just making, on the small parts of the agricultural value chains, rather than looking at the big sort of, you know, cross value chain initiatives that are, are going to inhibit scaling. And, and, and Brian, this is particularly important, of course, on finance, because finance isn't, isn't limited to one particular uh, value chain. So, so how do you get researchers, you know, and, and practitioners to think about those cross value chain or more system level uh, challenges. Yeah, I, um, we had a we have a partner with Aselli that's the International Growth Center housed at London School of Economics um, economists, and we had a session with them last week, and they put a slide up where they showed the number of academic papers in financial inclusion, um, microfinance essentially, and 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 it's that broader field, and it's essentially been exponential over the past ten to twelve years. And then they showed the number of papers in agricultural finance, um, and it's been ticking along at a, at a very low level. And so I think, um, and the microfinance sector in general has taken off from a combination initially of, of donor interest and very charismatic leadership and iconic organizations, and then increasingly um, more commercial business models that are serving part of that market, but by no means all of it, and certainly not um, when we talk about smallholder access to finance. But yeah, I think there's this um, reinforcing cycle between um, research and um, public or philanthropic investment in a sector and, and sector market development. And that we have yet to see that uh, flywheel take hold in agricultural finance, certainly not in um, the space I focus on, which is finance for small and medium enterprises. And it's it's very much needed, and um, you know we we might take a, a more narrow lens in into the debt side and lending, but there's a wide um, set of, of research uh, across finance for agriculture that um, we would we need more of the research minds tackling. Uh, thanks, Brian uh, and Peter. Do, how do you look at this from the you know the the research side in terms of how to how to bring research to those let's say cross sectoral or cross value chain questions? Yeah, yeah, that's an interest, interesting question, and, and I guess um, at, at 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 least the land grant universities in the United States, you know, we have three core missions: teaching, research, and extension, and that that's the way it was set up 150 years ago, and extension um, was put in place for us to take the knowledge from the university and extend that knowledge to the farmers and other people that can use that knowledge, that can put it into practice. And so at least within the land grant system in the United States, we have a lot of experience in, in trying to affect system change using the knowledge uh, from, from research and from the university. And so, but that's on a local basis, right? A local or, or a national basis. Um, are we going to transition or, or, or change ourselves into inter international development um, um, uh, agencies? Probably not. But at this, and, and so I think the I think the uh, the real key here is forming strong and strategic partnerships. And so and and so I think that from the research community, for us to form strong partnerships with the private sector, with multi multilateral organizations, uh, with other development players. Um, I think partnerships and relationships in that sphere is, is really where it's at. Um, certainly research plays a part in that, but there are a lot of other parts as well that, that, we've, that we've already talked about. And so I, I see the role of, of broad partnerships and, uh, and relationships across the, the, the range of activities and uh, of course, research is just one of those. So that's where I see that the future is informing these these strong partnerships. I mean, if I listen to both of you, uh, you know, it, it feels to me like when we're thinking on the action side, and I'm always, you know, I'm more on the, interested on the action side, although I'm very interested in the research questions as well. But I really want to see action happen. Um, we need to be thinking about the researchers, bring the researchers along. Don't just sort of, you know, work with them at the beginning to scope the opportunity or do some of that background homework. Um, and from your side, you know, Peter and the academic institution side, it's like, 
let's not sit in our ivory towers, but let's go and find implementers that we can really learn with uh, and help them uh, with that learning in, in, in action. And I'm just mindful of one specific opportunity that I'm sort of peripherally, peripherally involved in that really is taking this kind of cross value chain system type approach, which is um, uh, the, the, the um, food, uh, Food Action Alliance, I think that's the name of it, um, that's um, been led so far by the World Economic Forum. Uh, and it is very much this kind of cross-system, cross-value chain kind of thinking. Um, and it probably needs that kind of research partnership agenda uh, to come along with it um, as it works. So something I'll, I'll pick up in another in another forum. Let me move to Cisse. And, and Julie Howard has uh, put a couple of questions in uh, for you, Cisse. Um, one is uh, probably a small question, easy to answer. Are the donors that are supporting your initiative using a common M&E system? And if not, how complex is that for your team to deal with? And then as you went through the testing phase, what were some of the most maybe top two or three challenges that you encountered and changes that you made even in the testing phase to address those challenges? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Simon. Uh, I think in terms of the common uh, m &E uh, framework, when we start the uh, innovation phase, uh, especially when we do the innovation phase investment plan, we develop the framework, what is called one plan, one uh, budget, and one monitoring and evaluation system. I think that has really helped us uh, to have a common m &E system uh, from the federal level to the Kabale uh, and Warada level. Uh, and also in terms of now, uh, we are moving to what we call it a unified nutrition information system for Ethiopia, uh, which is a one uh, monitoring system, which is a DHIS2 embedded uh, multi-sectoral monitoring system. Uh, so that is also will help uh, once it is fully operational. Uh, we tested it in the innovation phase uh, to track all the performances using one uh, platform. Uh, maybe in terms of the donor-specific uh, ME uh, system, uh, the the challenge is not a challenge, but usually it's a, you know you need to align sometimes with donors' requirements uh, in terms of specific uh, programmatic reporting. Uh, so we will be extracting those uh, reporting uh, requirements to fit to the to the donors depending on how they require the, their uh, contribution to be reported. So we have those kinds of uh, reporting system. Uh, the second uh, uh, part of the the question, uh, can, can you remind me, Simon, sorry? Um, it was about the major challenges that you um, uh, came across, top two or three challenges in the testing phase and, and any changes you made in the program to adapt to those challenges. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the challenges were, uh, for instance, uh, the height of the turnover of uh, both the, the technical leadership as well as the political leadership uh, has been one of the, the, the challenge during the innovation phase. So how we managed was uh, we developed uh, a rigorous uh, orientation and also engagement plan. Uh, so that, uh, you know, every, uh, whenever we have those people uh, moved or uh, those people are transferred to, uh, to get uh, reorientation, uh, that is what uh, we have been uh, managing. The second challenge was uh, the gap between the investment need uh, and also uh, the, the, the amount that we have been able to manage uh, from uh, government as well as the, the development partners. Uh, so the coastal water-based plan has been key and also instrumental. Uh, but the most important that has enabled us to address, uh, you know, some of the financial constraint was the learning journey, which the high-level leadership has taken to the uh, innovation phase where it does. Uh, they went there, they understand how we are operating, they understand the challenges, and uh, for uh, excellencies, the ministers, for state ministers, and also other regional leaders were part of that. So by the time they come up, they came up with a very high level uh, recommendation uh, so that the government to you know accelerate the 
additional investment allocation and also support uh, to fill uh, some of the uh, funding gaps. So I think the high level leadership engagement uh, and also looking at how the contextual operationalization uh, will look like has been key in terms of addressing the, the, the funding uh, challenges that we face. Thank you, over to Simon. Great, excellent. I, I must say, I'm dying to come and see your initiative myself. It sounds so fascinating. It sounds like you're really making such great progress. Um, yeah, you are most welcome, Simon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the last question that I have from the audience that I want to pose to you, uh, and then I think uh, we can maybe just have a quick dialogue if any of you have any questions for each other, um, uh, is from Mark Blackett. And, and I think it's a super interesting question. I, I'm going to abbreviate it, Mark, a little bit, if you don't mind because um, it's you know fairly lengthy but essentially uh, what Mark is saying is that um, one of the most important ingredients of all of what we're talking about is building the capacity of institutions uh, to be uh, maintained and to, to, to be improved in the future and yet the capacity building space is he poses is uh, probably one of the most fragmented parts of the systems <laughs> around emerging market food and agriculture development and I tend to agree with you Mark on that point um, so the question then is what research is needed um, and, and what should that research focus on that could stimulate, you know, more scalable support for both the hard and the soft skill building? Um, maybe, Brian, I'll come back to you uh, to kick us off on that one. Thanks, Simon. And Mark and I have talked about this a little bit. The alliance that he leads, EMEA, is, brings together many of the capacity builders, um, and I think that they have a a research initiative that they're developing to, to do some benchmarking between the different implementers. And I think that's critical. That's essentially what we did on the lender side to understand the economics of the lending and then to be able to put together the incentives. And when it comes to capacity building, it's primarily been a donor funded marketplace to date and very fragmented in part because donors have their own ME systems uh, and there's varying levels of accountability around the quality of TA. It's also very difficult to measure often, especially the, the softer skills that are being developed. But I think that the capacity building market should move towards more standardized um, benchmarks around different service models um, and what is best in class in terms of cost. We would love to see capacity building be a fully financially sustainable market, but for the foreseeable future, it's going to require donor subsidies and how do donors know which models are most effective and cost efficient. So um, we're very interested to see the, the results from that work that EMEA is leading and um, hope to participate in it. Great, thanks. Um, Cissé, maybe let me come to you. Uh, you're obviously building capacity in a public sector environment primarily, but uh, you know, same thing. What what sort of research questions do you have in mind as you think about are you going to have enough, you know, nutritionists or educators or health workers or you know all the different kind of skill sets you're going to need to have uh, your scaled up uh, vision uh, be achieved. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Simon. I think one of the capacity building need is. Uh, specifically for the utilization of data. Uh, the Sakota Declaration has, uh, uh, you know, generates a lot of, uh, you know, originally Excel-based, now uh, web-based data are being generated. But in terms of data analysis, uh, utilization of the, the data for informed decision-making, uh, I think, except like the performance scorecard, you know, many people are not really interested to do, uh, you know, those kind of analysis, not a per se interest, but also the capacity to do the analysis uh, and also uh, utilization of that for decision making as well as also uh, advocacy. I think that is one critical gap. Uh, from programming perspective, the second area is to uh, document uh, the, the learning uh, and also the tools needed for the documentation of those uh, learnings. Uh, you know, learning has to be always ongoing. Uh, so I think ongoing learning, ongoing documentation, and also the capacity to publish, uh, you know, those learnings uh, is something that we really look forward, like from the organizations, like from the research side. Uh, those kind of capacities are, are really uh, needed. 
And uh, finally, the you know the Sakota Declaration is a multi-stakeholder, as I said, uh, multi-level as well as also multi-sectoral uh, program. Uh, so I think in terms of identifying and mapping out the various uh, stakeholders' need, the various stakeholders' interest, as well as also uh, you know developing uh, a well-formulated strategy, especially capacity building strategy for all stakeholders. Uh, this kind of capacity is also needed uh, from our side. Thank you so much. Over to Sam. Excellent. Thank you, Cisse. And, and Peter, from your side, uh, how, how do you think about the research around capacity building? Yeah, the, um, you know, obviously Purdue's been involved a lot in this area, as, as have many other um, universities. And um, it's fairly easy to do capacity building on a technical basis. And as Brian mentioned, a lot of this has been donor donor funded. Um, but to really have impact, uh, we need to think a little broader. You know, it's pretty pretty easy in the research community. We do we we conduct a project, we collect some data, we publish a paper, and we think the job's done. Um, and maybe from a research perspective, uh, it is. But from a development perspective, or from an impact perspective. Uh, I think that only just scratches the surface. And, um, you know, many of us have probably been in, in a situation where we've given a talk and the folks from the Ministry of Agriculture attend and the folks from the University and Ministry of Education attend, but they sit on different sides of the auditorium and when it's over, they all leave and go home without talking to each other. And so it, it requires a, a larger system change as well sometimes. And maybe this comes down to, to government priorities and government policy, where the researchers and the extension people talk to each other and, um, and form a, a continuous chain of, of uh, information from research through to extension, through to, to farmers or other um, system operators that can use that information. And so often that piece in the middle is, is and that connection is, is what's missing, I think. Um, and, and so I, I and, and it's difficult for us from the outside to influence that very much, I think. Um, you know, that comes down to internal priorities and internal um, um, uh, structures, but, but maybe we can nudge that in the right direction a little bit. Good. So lots of nudging all over the place. Okay, we're going to need to wrap up. Um, I'm going to ask each of you, um, and uh, Brian, I'll come back to you, then Cisse, then Peter again. Uh, if you have one question that's now in your mind as a result of the conversation we've had today, uh, that could be a, a focus for further research. Uh, what is it? Keep it short. Just one question, Brian. How can private sector interventions um, spur further government investment? Yeah, you know, to go from from subscale to scale. Great. Thanks, Brian. See safe. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, I think, you know, the question I have is in terms of, you know, what are really the drivers of the multi-sectoral uh, programming for success? Uh, we have some learning, but that needs to be researched more. And also, get, uh, we need to have more information for us to be informed during expansion and also for the scale-up phase. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Issa. And Peter, for you? Yeah, yeah, I think CSA is, um, I agree with CSA entirely, that, that I think forming uh, these partnerships um, across different sectors and trying to align our priorities. And so, so outcomes are, are, value, are valued at these different levels. And so we can form partnerships from research through to extension, through the private sector and government. Um, how do we better form those, those partnerships? Okay, and I'm going to close. I'm going to take uh, moderator's prerogative and have three questions of my own, but it's going to slightly echo what you were just saying. So one of them is, you know, how, how do we get leaders not to fear complexity? Uh, you know, I've, I've been a passionate devotee of multi-stakeholder action initiatives for years myself, and I often get that pushback that people say it's too complex. And CC, I think you eloquently alluded to the role that, you know, learning journeys, for example, for leaders can play in helping them understand why you need to embrace complexity, but 
I think that, you know, how do we get leaders not to fear complexity in, in, in addressing scaling and system change for me is the first question. The second one, I think, is something I alluded to a couple of times in some of my questions, which is, you know, how do we under how do we identify those actors within the systems themselves who are the ones that we should corral around in terms of, you know, they are the ones who are going to maintain and improve the system in the future, even if we're approaching it as outside actors, uh, and then, you know, understand their capacity building needs and their incentives so that they can be set up for success in the future. And then thirdly, and I guess this gets to your last point, Peter, as well, is, you know, how do we get funders then to embrace the need to link all these pieces together um, and, 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 you know, incentivize the uh, multi-stakeholder action? And, and I think what for me was one of the big takeaways of today's discussion this need to have researchers and actors working more closely together, not just at the beginning of an initiative, but throughout the journey of these uh, initiatives. And, and I think funders need to incentivize that. Otherwise, it's always going to be difficult to happen. And, and we still have too much of this funding gap between the funding for research over here and the funding for implementation over there. So with that, I'm going to thank you, uh, the three of you, um, for excellent discussion today. Uh, hopefully insightful to our audience as well as <laughs> the four of us. Um, thank you to Jerry uh, for his opening remarks and for you know Purdue University for hosting and organizing this event. And uh, Jerry and Peter, we look forward to engaging with you next year if you choose to, uh, you know, in, in pursuing this journey further. Um, thanks everybody. Thanks for the good questions from our audience. And uh, I'm now gonna officially close today's event. Thank you all, bye-bye.